So this is something that I feel really passionate about. I did a two and a half year postdoc at Cornell. Um, when I first came over, we were working with dairy. I moved into beef about four, four and a half years ago now. Went into, went into consulting about 12 months ago. And this I really could talk about for you know hours because I personally think it's going to be really important. But my main goal both today and as a job is to give you guys the tools and the facts and the figures and the talking points so that when you get those queries from people you know at church people in your family random people in the grocery store about should we be really eating beef is it good for the planet isn't it causing climate change isn't beef full of hormones you know all of those kind of questions i want to be able to give you the facts and the figures and the talking points to say actually beef is good and this is why it's good and this is what we're doing and this is how we're continuously improving okay so that's my main goal today and you know, basically for the rest of my life. So one of my main messages to you, and, and this I truly believe, is that it doesn't matter what system you have. It doesn't matter whether you have Angus heifers waiting to be AI'd in Montana. It doesn't matter whether you have Brahmins in South America, or whether you have Charolais cross steers in a small feedlot in Eastern Montana. Whether you have Angus, Hereford, Belter, Galloway, whether you have 50 cows or 5,000 cows, whether you feedlot finish, whether you grass finish, Every system can be sustainable. And this is that, that buzzword that out there is now on every menu, every, every news article, it's all over social media, it's the buzzword. But every single system can be sustainable, providing three things are in place. And the first one, which has always been the most important one, is economic viability. Doesn't matter what else you do, if you're not making money this year or next year or the year after and that carries on as you all know you're not going to have a business in five or ten years so economics has always been the most important that will continue to be the most important but the second one which has come in more in the last five to ten years is the environmental side because now consumers care more the retailers care more policymakers care more about the impacts that we have on land and air and water so while we've always taken care of all of those things, we need to communicate that better now than we have in the past. And that leads into the third one, social acceptability. Because again, five years ago, we got some questions from some friends or family. Nowadays, the questions have got broader. Consumers want to understand more about their food, which is great, but they'll ask us more questions. We have a far bigger audience because of things like Twitter and Facebook and Google and Wikipedia. And there are unfortunately a huge number of people out there willing to tell our story for us because they know the industry better than we do. You know, they know how we should raise beef. They know what we should do with dairy cattle. And they will tell other people what they should eat, what they should buy, what we should do every single day. So those three facets, economic viability and environmental responsibility and social acceptability are the three things that need to be in place every day. Now they will change over time. Things that were okay last year from a social point of view, so pink slime, for example, was, was okay until the big uproar about it and now it's pink slime is bad, right? So th this isn't something that's constant. This will change every day, every week, every year. But if we keep those three things in place and continuously improve as a beef industry, we'll continue to make strides. The problem is that to the consumer, this buzzword again here often only means grass-fed, only organic, only local, only heirloom breed. You know, it doesn't mean a feedlot, it doesn't mean cow-calf, it doesn't mean big ag, in quotes. But the modern beef industry, the conventional beef industry, is eminently sustainable. It doesn't just mean the buzzwords. And I will defend the rights of anybody who wants to pay $29 per pound for grass-fed eye of ribeye. That's absolutely their choice. If they want to do that, that's fine. Personally, I'm going to buy great tasting conventional beef and spend the rest of my money on ridiculously expensive cowgirl boots because that's my choice, you know. <laughs> but if you want to pay this much for beef that's just as good as any other beef, you know, that's your choice and that's absolutely fine. I have no issue with that. But what I do have an issue with is where people say my choice is this 
and you should all be doing that because my choice is the right choice. Okay. So as I say, as an industry, we've been doing this for years. And if we didn't look after the air, the land, the water, the animals, we wouldn't have an industry now, quite frankly. If we hadn't cared for our local communities over the years, we wouldn't have third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation farms and ranches in place. So we have always done this. But to the consumer who gets their information from you know Wikipedia and Huffington Post and Time magazine and so on and so on. The industry is seen as being big bad ag. It's factory farms, it's CAFOs, it's doing bad things for the environment. And as was talked about earlier, we have a decided advantage as a beef industry over, for example, poultry and swine industries. Because we take all of this pasture that we can't do anything else with. Well, we can't grow grapes or artichokes or corn even. And we make safe, affordable, delicious beef, beef out of it every single day. So we have a huge story to tell. And we have some really good points to talk about. But the question is, how do we do that? And how do we continue to improve to, um, the industry over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years? Because we do face this challenge. And I, I'm, somebody talked about it earlier, I think, but we're going to have more and more people by the year 2050. We passed the 7 billion mark on a global basis in 2011. By 2050, we're going to have about 9.5 billion people, so about a third more people. To feed those people, we're going to need more beef, which is the darkest green, more pork, and more poultry. So by 2050, we need 70% more milk, meat, and eggs to feed the global population. But we face this challenge, because if we look at this purple line coming down, that's arable land per person. So per person, we'll also have less land to grow animal feed and human food by that point. So we have to improve productivity, and we have to improve efficiency. But while as a, as a nation, we will celebrate efficiency in terms of you know, iPads and faster cars and all these things, Productivity and efficiency in, in terms of food, people get a, get a little bit frightened. They back off. They're like, technology's good when it's a faster computer, but when it's in my food, I'm not so sure that I like it. You know. So we have this challenge to overcome. But we potentially have a bigger challenge because of the anti-animal ag groups. So groups like PETA, groups like HSUS, really know the images that get people's attention. You know, they know that if they put a billboard up with Pamela Anderson in a bikini, they, that gets more a attention than just a picture of a beef cow or a bit of data. So they know the messages to get to the consumer. And they know the demonstrations as well. These two girls at the top right were in Washington, D.C. The picture was taken about two years ago. The same demonstration was, was in Bozeman, <coughs> my hometown, about 18 months ago. So these girls are everywhere. And behind this banner here, they have absolutely no clothes on whatsoever. Not surprisingly, that gets a certain amount of attention from a certain amount of the population, right? But what also gets attention is this banner. One pound of meat equals 2,463 gallons of water. It doesn't say a lot of water, quite a bit of water, you know, much as water. It says 2,463 gallons. That implies precision. That implies someone sat down with Excel and a pen and calculated irrigation water, drinking water, sanitation, processing, you know, all the things that make a pound of meat. The fact that this figure here is about six times too high doesn't make the press, because that's not exciting. Saying beef uses 441 gallons of water per pound of beef, well, you know, yay. But this number sounds really big. And so makes good press as maybe we shouldn't be eating beef if we care about the planet, if we care about our kids. So that kind of rolls nicely into Meatless Mondays. First came about in about 2006, is becoming increasingly prevalent in schools, hospitals, canteens, workplaces. I guarantee if you, again, read the Washington Post, Huffington Post, Time Magazine, New York Times, on a Monday, there will be recipes, there will be tips. You, on a Monday, can go meatless. You can have the veggie surprise or the tofu fajita, odd though that kind of sounds. And you can save the planet. 
LA City Council last October adop uh, officially adopted Meatless Mondays as the way to cut the city's carbon footprint. So if you live in LA, you can still drive your Hummer everywhere, but if you choose the tofu sandwich versus the hamburger, you know, you can feel good that you're saving the planet, saving your kids, saving your grandkids. But if we apply science to it, according to the US EPA, meat production in the States only accounts for 2.1% of our total carbon footprint. So the, the other 97.9 comes from everything else we do, driving cars, flying planes, building computers, all the other things. But again, according to the media and the uh, environmental activists, if we all went meatless, if all 314, 314 million people in the States went meatless every Monday, we could have a huge impact, right? We could save the planet single-handedly by that one action. And unfortunately, to most consumers, that's, that's relatively easy to do. You know, yeah, I can change the hamburger for the cheese sandwich one day a week. That, that's, that's kind of doable. I can achieve that, you know? The problem is it almost makes no difference. Because as I say, 314 million people in the States going meatless every Monday for a whole year cuts our national carbon footprint by less than one third of 1%. Now, I'm not here to say we shouldn't do everything we can to cut carbon, land, water, resources. All of those are positive things. But to single out meat as the thing that we shouldn't eat when every single food we eat, whether it's an apple, a hamburger, or a cheese sandwich, has some environmental impact, and everything we do every day has an impact, to single out meat consumption seems pretty unfair. And it leads to other questions as well. As I said, everybody has a choice of what they want to eat, and that's absolutely fine. You want to eat the Reuben or the trout sandwich or the vegetarian or the vegan, that's absolutely your choice. I have no issues with that. In the interests of uh, true, <laughs> true confessions, I guess, when I was back in high school, age 15, I was a vegan because that's what we did in high school. You know, we were high school girls. We were going to make life really difficult for our parents. We were going to be vegan, and we did. And by the time I was 16, I was eating bacon as if pigs were going to be extinct, and I haven't looked back. <laughs> but if you want to be vegetarian, if you want to be vegan, if you want to be fruitarian, you know, that's your choice. That's fine. But don't tell me that I should adopt your choices in food or clothes or <coughs> religion or anything else. That's your choice. This is my choice. And the same should apply to food. Now, secondly, everything on this slide, whether it's jello, whether it's uh, camera films, whether it's gumballs, all of these things have a component from cattle in them. To the consumer, we think about, well, beef comes from cattle, and I guess leather comes from cattle. All of these things, and many others as well, have components from cattle. So if we have fewer cows, what happens to sourcing all of these other things that we use every single day? in terms of carbon emissions, land use, water use, fossil fuels, and so on. And then thirdly, I did a very similar talk this, uh, this morning at about 9.30. And imagine we've had those doors closed ever since, and we've eaten in here. We ate breakfast in here. We had a bean surprise for breakfast. We had a tofu and lentil bake at lunchtime. We've had delicious bean-based power bar cookies at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And we're going to eat dinner in here. And because we're pretending it's Monday, we're going to have more beans at 5 o'clock. This is not going to be a good place to be after sitting in here eating beans for eight hours. Because we make methane as well. You know, it's not just the cows. It's not just the sheep. People make methane as well. So if we're going to advise large-scale dietary change, we've got to do it on the basis of not just, well, I'll change the hamburger for the cheese sandwich. We've got to think about all of the other implications as well, not just that simple, easy type change. So I'm going to take you back to 1977, which is right here, projecting out to 2027 here. This is 2007. This is beef yield per animal on a hot carcass weight basis. And again, as was talked about earlier, we've made great gains. We now know better how to feed, how to breed, how to manage our cows. So on a hot carcass weight basis, in 1977, we were at about 603 pounds per animal. 2007, 773 pounds per animal. The question is, where do we go? Can we keep getting bigger and bigger? 
can we be slaughtering animals that weigh 3,000 pounds, 4,000 pounds, 5,000 pounds in 20 and 30 years' time? In theory, we could just keep getting bigger and bigger cattle, right? From a packing plant point of view, they're saying already we're getting too big at 1,400 pounds even. You know, they don't want bigger and bigger and bigger carcasses. And though to any of my three brothers, the thought of a T-bone that weighs like 100 ounces is, is the perfect steak, you know, to most consumers, it just doesn't work. Portion sizes don't work that way. So in contrast to the dairy industry, where they've improved milk yield per cow fourfold since 1944, in the beef industry, beef yields probably can't increase that much. But while we have a huge opportunity in terms of productivity and efficiency, is to improve growth rate per day. Because the fewer days it takes us to, to raise any animal from birth to slaughter, fewer days means less resources, less land, less water, and as you all know, less economics. If your cattle grow better, you either sell more cattle or you sell the same amount of cattle weight earlier, so you save economics. So we've got this dual whammy going on between the two. So again, we're comparing 77 to 2007. To make the same amount of beef in 1977 and 2007, it took five animals in 77 compared to four animals in 2007 because of that carcass weight increase. But as I say, growth rate is equal, uh, equally, if not more important. So five animals, five lots of feed, five lots of waste, versus four, four, and four. So we've saved things here. But the growth rate improvements are even more impressive. We've gone from 609 days to raise the average animal from birth to slaughter in 1977 to 485 in 2007. We've saved 124 days of land, resources, water, fertilizer, irrigation, etc. So if we multiply out the five animals times 609 days, compared to four animals times 485 days, again, we're making the same amount of beef. But in 1977, it took us just over 3,000 animal days of resources versus just over 1,900. So we've made great savings. So if we look at it on a whole system basis, all of the inputs and all of the outputs that go into making a pound of beef, from making the pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers to grow the, the, the crops, either the corn or the grass, all the way to the arrival of the animals at the slaughterhouse door. Purple line is 1977, green bars going up 2007. So we've got that increased carcass weight per animal, 31% more beef per animal. And that means to make a pound of beef in 2007, we only need 70% of the total animals. By that, I mean cows, calves, heifers, bulls, steers, all of the animals from the cow-calf all the way through to finished cattle. Because of a combination of fewer animals because of the greater carcass weight and the improved growth rates, for pound of beef in 2007, we only need 81% of the feed, 88% of the water, and this is going to be the really big thing soon, I think, and 67% of the land. And water and land are the two things that the anti-animal anti -animal ag activist groups, it's quite a mouthful, are going to jump on us for in the future, because they know and the consumer knows we can't see carbon, we can't taste it, we can't touch it, we can't picture like a kilo of carbon or a ton of carbon. But we all know, whether we're in the ag industry or not, that we need water to give our animals, for us ourselves, and to feed our crops. And in terms of land use, there's a perception out there that land is land is land. I had once had a really heated argument with a guy from Peter outside the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. And with a straight face, he told me that on any patch of land, if you could grow grass, you can grow corn. I found that kind of interesting now that I live in Montana. And with the best will in the world, I love my home state, but we have hills that look like this, full of rocks. I mean, you could perhaps broadcast plants some corn kernels and hope that something comes up, but, you know, we can't. So land isn't land isn't land. We can't grow everything everywhere. So it's really impressive that simply by doing what the beef industry does best, improving productivity, improving efficiency, n not a big drive to cut carbon or cut land or cut water, but simply by b having better management of our cattle over time, we've cut all of these resources. And it applies to waste as well. Fairly obviously, fewer animals, 
less feed means less manure, less methane, less nitrous oxide, and the carbon footprint per pound of beef has come down by 16% over the last 35 years. If that was achieved by IBM, Apple, Honda, Toyota, any big company, it would be all over the press. You know, yay, company X, you've done this. We've done that as a beef industry. And as I say, it hasn't been because we've tried to cut carbon simply by improving productivity. So the question is, how do we continue to do that? And this is where I again have to emphasize that there really is a place for every system and they can all be sustainable. I'm not against any system whatsoever. <coughs> I'm really not. But what really bugs me is mismarketing, the type of marketing that says my system's better than your system because I use this or I don't use this, that plays on consumer fears about things like drugs or antibiotics or hormones or implants or anything else. We've even got a quote here from Michael Pollan in the New York Times. Michael Pollan's a, a journalism professor at UC Ber uh, Berkeley. He's written several books. He was in the movie um, Food Inc. He's become very, very popular in terms of telling people what they should eat and how they should eat. And he writes these books. Now, if you haven't read The Omnivore's Dilemma, which was his book that came out in 2006, you really need to. Not because it'll make you feel happy and good and sunny. Um, if you're anything like me, and bear in mind that I read this book about four years ago now, so it was pre the whole you know, baby bump, but when I read the book, I had a very large bottle of Jack Daniels next to me because, quite frankly, I needed something to keep my blood pressure down a little bit when I read the book. Because there's, there are some facts in there, that, that there is some truth in there, but there's a lot of spin in there as well. And because it's so easy to understand and so palatable to the consumer, it becomes a really dangerous book. Because all of this must be true, and look what those beef farmers and those dairy farmers and those corn farmers are doing every single day to, to kill us all. Okay? So we even have advertisements that look like this. <laughs> Not surprisingly, this is from an anti-beef campaign. So we have this attractive looking Hereford with ingredients on the side. Estradiol, estradiol benzoate, testosterone propionate, progesterone, zeranal, TBA, MGA, which is interesting because this is pretty obviously a boy and we give it MGA to heifers, but you know, regardless <laughs> of that, this boy given female hormones and beef. Again, to the consumer, the image is the feedlot industry, for example, takes these animals, pumps them full of these hormones that do goodness knows what to the animals, goodness knows what to us. And there is some beef in there, but if you want to eat it, you must be kind of crazy, you know? Well, I've had the conversation about hormones several times with some of my dearest friends, and these really are smart people, you know? They aren't dumb, they aren't ill-informed, they care. They care about the food they eat, the food they feed their kids, the food they feed their grandkids. And we'll have the conversation about, you know, I've given up feeding our kids beef or dairy. Oh, why is that? Well, it's full of hormones. You know, and everybody knows that, that, that all, all the farmers and ranchers pump them full of hormones, and then the meat's full of hormones. It gets into our kids, and that's why they are developing at the age of, you know, three, five, seven, nine, whatever it might be. I've heard it so many times. So we're going to put it into context here. Now, it is absolutely true that a steak from an implanted animal will have more estrogen than a steak from a non-implanted animal. 5.1 nanograms of estrogen in the 8-ounce steak from an implanted animal compared to 3.5 nanograms from a non-implanted animal. It's absolutely true. There's like a 40% increase per steak. Bear in mind that one nanogram is a bit like a blade of grass on a football field. It's a teeny, teeny, teeny concentration. But there is more estrogen in the implanted steak. But then we've got the birth control pill. 100 million women on a global basis every single day take these tiny little pills, you know, tiny little pills, it's big. Each of those contains 35,000 nanograms of estrogen. So to get the same amount of estrogen from implanted beef, the average woman, for example, would have to eat over 3,000 pounds of implanted beef every single day or on an annual beef consumption basis, would have to eat beef for 58 years to get the same amount of estrogen as is in one tiny pill. 
As a side note, I showed this at the Wisconsin Cattlemen's Association meeting back in uh, January, and there was a guy at the front who, quite frankly, looked as if he was about 135 years old. And I showed this, and he says, you know, I don't want to mess with a woman who can eat more than 3,000 pounds of implanted beef a day. <laughs> <laughs> so true. I am so not going to argue with that one. That's a really good point. But again, it, it puts it into context. And obviously, this is a female type comparison. But guys, there's a lot of estrogen in bio as well, far more than there ever is in beef. So if any men out there are concerned about estrogen in beef, you really need to look at your beer consumption way before you ever need to look at your beef consumption. Alternatively, look at your cabbage consumption. Because one ounce of cabbage has more than a thousand times more estrogen than beef from an implanted animal. But I've yet to see Huffington Post, Time Magazine, any of these ranting on about the cabbage farmers who are making all of our children grow much faster than before because of all the hormones. Every single food that we eat contains, ho contains hormones with the possible exceptions of salt and sugar. Whether again it's a cheese sandwich or an apple or a hamburger, they all contain hormones. But we've really got to put it into context to understand whether it's an important amount or if it's something really, really tiny. So we're going to go back to grass-fed versus corn-fed beef. It's a comparison we published in January of last year, 2012. Comparing three systems, conventional, natural, grass-fed. Again, all of these systems are good. They all have their place. In terms of conventional beef, which is, as we almost all know, cow-calf operation. Calves are weaned at about seven months. 85% of those calves go into a background of operation and then into the feedlot as yearling-fed beef. The remaining 15% of, of wean calves go in, into the feedlot in, in terms of calf-fed beef. And in this system, and in this system, we also have inputs of dairy calves from the, da from the dairy industry direct into the feed, not again as calf fed beef. So in this system, if where approved by the FDA for that class of cattle, we use implants in the background in the feedlot, MGA for heifers in the feedlot, beta agonists in the feedlot, and ionophores for the cows in the cow calf and in the background in the feedlot operation. So those four technologies. If we do all of this, we're going to end up with a carcass weight of about 800 pounds per animal. It's going to take us about 444 days to raise those animals from birth to slaughter. Now imagine we want to make the same amount of beef, 26.1 billion pounds of beef per year, as we do most years. Alternatively, changing whole scale over to natural or grass-fed. Now, there are, there are as many definitions of natural beef as there are people in Oklahoma, almost. You know, there's a million definitions. In this case, natural beef is exactly the same as conventional beef without ionophores, either ionophores implants, beta agonists, or MGA. Everything else exactly the same. If we take out those technologies, we lose 86 pounds of carcass weight. And it takes us about 20 more days to raise those animals. Now, if we have less carcass weight and it takes more days, we need more total cattle, 14.4 million more total cattle to make 26.1 billion pounds of beef per year. Again, this is cows, calves, calves heifers, bull steers, all of the animals in the total beef herd. If we go more extensive still, and again, these are average numbers for a grass fed, we're Slaughtering animals at about 1,050 pounds gives us a carcass weight of about six, 615 pounds. So compared to conventional here, we've lost 185 pounds of carcass weight. And it's taken us 235 more days. So it's effectively taken us 50% more time and we're losing carcass weight. Again, that means that on a whole system basis, if overnight all the feedlots went and everything went to grass fed, we could do it. So we need 65 million more animals, heck of a lot more cows, calves, heifers, bulls, steers, just to make the same 26.1 billion pounds of beef. And there are other consequences too. So in terms of land use, the extra land that we'd need to supply all of those animals every single year, 131 million more acres of land. That's equivalent to 75% of the land area of Texas, just to make the same amount of beef per year. In terms of carbon emissions, the 
extra carbon associated with making all of that beef from grass-fed versus conventional would be equal to adding nearly 27 million cars to the road every single year, a huge increase in the total carbon footprint. Now, the question that I almost always got from somebody was, carbon sequestration, what about that? That's going to save it, right? No problem, carbon sequestration. Sequestration in, in this instance is a really good thing. But the thing that we have to consider is that the corn-fed operation also has a cow-calf operation and a backgrounder. So potentially, we can get carbon sequestration in, in any cow-calf operation in, in most backgrounders. So really, the difference between grass-fed beef and, and corn-fed beef on a carbon sequestration basis is only based on the finishing period. Because we need more carbon, because the animals grow less fast, because they have a lower carcass weight in the grass-fed system, the, the hope or the assumption would be that, that the carbon taken in by this land in the finishing system could outweigh the methane and the nitrous oxide from all of those animals. Potentially, under fabulous management on land that had just been changed from cropland into pasture, that's conceptually possible. But on most enterprises, it wouldn't be possible. And it's simply because we'd need to sequester 0.5 metric tons of carbon per hectare per year. So that's 0.5 uh, metric tons per four acres or so per year. And that's about three times more than we see out there in published papers at the moment. That doesn't mean on an individual system basis that it can't be done anywhere. But on average, the ground would have to take in a heck of a lot more carbon than it currently can to outweigh the lower productivity in the grass-based system. Now, as I say, we can't see carbon, we can't touch it, we can't taste it, we can't buy it at the store. But water is the one that people understand and consumers understand. And I know that all of you understand, given the drought over the last year and two years. If we convert its whole scale over to grass-fed beef versus conventional beef, our annual water increase would be 468 billion gallons. To put that into context, it's the annual requirements of 53 million households. As I said earlier, at the moment we have 314 million people in the States. So on a two-person household basis, we have about 150 million households. This is like adding a third more people in terms of total water. I'm not saying that there's not a place for grass-fed. It's a fabulous system, and in some areas, it works on a whole-scale basis. <coughs> Brazil, Argentina, Australia, perfect. But in our situation here, the most efficient use is potentially pasture and range for the cow-calf, pastures and byproducts for the stocker, and then byproducts, corn and soy, etc., for the feedlot. So, technology use. This is a similar graph to the one earlier, but we're going the other way now. We're adding in technology across the graph. Again, we want to make the same 26.1 billion pounds of beef per year. No technology. At slaughter, we get a hot carcass weight of about 724 pounds. It takes 512 days. We add in a beta agonist, we get 33 pounds more hot carcass weight in the same day, so more beef per animal. Also adding an implant, we get even more carcass weight. We've gone from 724 to 800, so 76 pounds more carcass weight, and we've lost 26 days. So we've got more carcass weight in fewer days, even better. And if we add in both implants and beta agonists, we're now up to 833 pounds, so an 80, 89, no, 109 pound carcass weight increase with 26 fewer days. So that means we can do all that we do with fewer cattle, or as I say, with the same amount of cattle, we can make more and more and more beef using the same resources, which is going to have positive effects. So in terms of one 800 pound carcass, using implants plus beta agonists cuts our total carbon footprint by almost 11%, which doesn't seem like it's that much. But on a carbon basis, the cows in the cow-calf herd account for somewhere, depending on the system, between 65 and 80% of our total carbon emissions. And those aren't changed by implants or beta agonists. 
So given that, this 11% decrease is pretty cool. So as I say, per carcass, per 800 pound carcass, by using safe technologies approved by the FDA, we can save four times the feed, we can save an acre of land, we can save nearly 23,000 gallons of water per carcass. On a whole industry basis, that could be huge. But again, to the consumer, that's a kind of difficult message because it's like, well, I care about land and I care about water. I don't care enough to really pay more for it or to actively do something about it, you know? So what do people care about? Well, generally, people care about feeding kids. Now, we've talked about feeding the world over and over again over the last one, two, and five years. And feeding the world to the consumer doesn't really resonate. It should, just like we should all care about kids in Africa and India and so on and so on. But to be honest, we care more about our kids than we do kids in a far-off country somewhere, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's sad, but it's true. But in theory, we're going to care more about our kids and our friends' kids and our local kids than we will about kids in... Pennsylvania or uh, California, let's say. So being an immense nerd, on a uh, Sunday night, about last July now, I calculated how much extra beef we get on one steer given implants and beta agonists. So this isn't the total beef, this is just the extra beef on, on that animal. And the extra beef on one single carcass, ac according to last year's figures, will supply seven children with their beef-containing school meals for a whole year. Now that's something that should resonate with every consumer out there, parent or not, because we can feed more kids, keep them from hunger, especially in, in a world where even in big cities over here, school meals are often the only source of good a protein that kids actually get. Now I should just add the caveat that these numbers were based on 2000 and 11 figures, and they've since then changed the portion size for school lunches. So this amount of beef probably now serves, you know, 35 kids, because this is a portion of beef nowadays in a school lunch. But still, if we can feed more children, doesn't that sound like a real positive? So to go on from that, we're going to talk about all practices now, or rather four practices, beta agonists and, and implants still. But we're going to add in two more things to get this 20% cut in the carbon footprint per pound of beef. We're going to add in every cow is going to have a calf. And secondly, we're going to add in effective parasite control. Parasite control should be an easy sell to any consumer because they treat their dogs and their cats for fleas and ticks. Isn't it entirely humane that we should do the same for our cattle? for flies and ticks and worms and so on. We should be doing that in the interest of animal welfare. But if we do that, we also get benefits in terms of improved repro, improved growth, improved productivity. So if we have these four things in here, beta agonist, implants, improved repro and parasite control, then per 800 pound carcass, we're saving seven tons of feed, nearly two acres of land, and 37,000 gallons of water per carcass. Again, huge savings with an economic saving as well because our cattle are performing better and so therefore we see those economic gains. But if we just think about parasite control, nothing else, think about the average US herd containing about 35 cows. The extra beef simply from that herd, not the total beef but the extra beef used by effective parasite control. That beef will supply 19 families with their average beef demand every single year. So 19 families of four people eating about 60 pounds of beef per adult. Again, that's a huge benefit for doing something that we should be doing from an animal welfare basis for every cow out there on the planet. So we can have positives out of this that should resonate with the consumer. The problem is to the retailer, to the restaurant chain, those consequences, those thoughts about antibiotics or technologies or hormones aren't often considered. So we have chains like Chipotle, where I haven't eaten and to be honest I will not eat because of quotes like this. 
It means that wherever possible, we use meat from animals raised without the use of antibiotics or added hormones. I just want to underline with the pointer here, whenever possible. Because if they couldn't get those cattle on a Wednesday afternoon from the market, they had conventional cattle, mm. you know. So it doesn't mean all of our beef, poultry, um, pork doesn't have these in, but whenever possible. To add an insult to injury, on TV last week, I think I saw about 47 times the commercial for Panera's breakfast sandwich with antibiotic-free ham in it. And I'm like, all ham that we buy is antibiotic-free. But it's being advertised as, look at us. We're doing a great job. We're saving your lives with antibiotic-free ham. Well, it's also elephant-free ham. But that doesn't seem to make the headlines, you know? I mean, just because it isn't in there, that's not a selling point. So, by contrast to the touchy-feely, happy, we're doing good for you and your kids image, McDonald's, often thought of as big bad food. You know, they make us buy Big Macs because we're addicted to them, and then we get fat, and it's McDonald's fault, right? You know, it, it isn't our fault at all, it's their fault. McDonald's put out this quote last October in an interview, and I was really cheered by it. Because by contrast to the earlier one, can we say we're buying any sustainable beef today? No, we can't. Could we be? We might be. They don't know. They haven't defined it yet. And that's where we as an industry have an opportunity to say, let us help you understand it. Let us tell you what we do and why we do it and how it saves land, saves water, saves carbon, saves resources. Let us help you understand what this means in the context of beef, and therefore hopefully avoid the hormone-free, antibiotic-free, implant-free situation that we could otherwise be in. Because being from England, one of my biggest fears for the beef industry over here, and I don't think it'll come from government, is that some big retail chain somewhere says, you know, we're going to take out all of those beta agonists because they're obviously bad. We're going to take out all of those hormones that are bad. And the beef in industry will, on a whole, s whole scale basis, just have to not adopt any of these safe technologies. And we'll lose productivity. And we'll need more land, more carbon, more water. Because to come from the EU, where they import two, 236,000 metric tons of beef every single year. And they care about carbon. They've signed up to Kyoto. They've made pledges and promises to cut carbon emissions. Yet they import all of this beef from here, from Australia, from Argentina, from Uruguay, from Brazil. And that's all not treated with hormones or beta agonists. So that means more land, more resources, more carbon. Well, just in terms of the carbon emissions associated with that 236,000 million um, thousand metric tons of beef, if they just allowed those, it's like taking 214,000 cars off the road every single year. They could make a positive step in terms of carbon emissions if they allowed technologies that we use over here that are safe both for the animals and for the people. So I'm fairly sure you've heard about uh, the, the, the Tyson Zilmax issue, um, which came into play about August 7th or so now. And then um, Merck took uh, sales of Zilmax in the US and Canada out on August 13th. Is that right? 13th? Yeah. OK. So according to Tyson, they would take no more cattle with Zilmax after September 6th and, and on the basis of animal welfare. And that's their choice, obviously. But again, it has longer lasting implications. The first one being, if I don't know the cattle industry, and I'm a person in, in an office working for a big corporation somewhere, I hear the word beta agonist, and that sounds kind of scary. And, and I've seen this, these things about Zilmax in the, in, the, in the newspapers. So I say, well, maybe I sh if, if Zilmax is coming out, maybe Optiflex should also go. Maybe we should take all the beta agonists out, because they obviously aren't good things. The beta agonists are coming out. We should take the implants out of the, of the <coughs> chain as well, because the consumers don't want them. If we take the implants out, we should take the 
repro hormones out and the antibiotics out and it goes down and down and down the chain and we lose more and more and more gains every single year. So some work we published at the American Society of Animal Science meetings in July this year. Bear in mind here this is both beta agonists, Zilmax and Optiflex. But if they both came out of the beef chain to make the same amount of beef every year again, 26.1 billion pounds of beef, we need 3.5 million more cattle. If we, if we leave the beta agonists in but t t take the implants out, we need 10 million more cattle to make the same amount of beef. If we take both of them out, 15 million more cattle to make the same amount of beef. Again, more cattle, more resources. In terms of land use, without beta agonists, we need more land equal to the land area of Maryland, right here. No implants, land equal to South Carolina. Neither technology, land equal to Louisiana. Again, lower productivity, less technology, we mean more resources. Water use, which again, as I say, is, is one of the really big factors. No, ba no beta agonists, 1.9 million households. No implants, 4.5. No technology, 7.3. We, we make more and more and more losses in, in the system. And in terms of fossil fuel use, which should be a real high issue for all of these companies, again, more and more and more lost. If we lose beta agonists, if we lose implants, or if we lose both. And as I said earlier, it's not just about resource use. There is a direct link between economics and environmental impact. And I have heard the quotes by people saying, well, I'm a cow-calf person, let's say, in Pennsylvania. And I ship my calves to a background, and then, and then that goes to the feedlot. So why do I care about a technology that's, that's only used for 25 or, or so days in the feedlot when I'm cow-calf? That doesn't affect me, right? That's not a problem. I am not an economist. I'm an animal scientist, but I have just enough number know-how to be kind of dangerous, you know? So the other night, I calculated on a whole industry basis the revenue loss from losing Zilmax. If we lose it and it never comes back and it isn't replaced by anything else, every single day, on a one-day basis, the beef industry loses $1.6 million. So in 10 days, $16 million. So by September 16th, it'll be $10 million. By October 6th, it'll be whatever, 30 times 1.6 million is, four, $48 million, something like that. And it goes up and up and up and up. On a per animal basis, if we lost both Zilmax and Optiflex, that's at a cost of $33 per head at the feedlot. If we just lose Zilmax, that's a cost of $23 per head at the feedlot. And that's the feedlot guys, right? That doesn't matter because I'm cow-calf over here and there's people between me and the feedlots. Oh no, that loss at the feedlot is going to come right back down the chain. And it's going to hit the backgrounder to a little bit, but it will absolutely hit the cow-calf guy. So everything that happens higher up the chain comes right back down again in terms of economics, environmental impact. So it affects the entire industry as a whole. We've got to do, all of us in every sector, whether we're seed stock, cow, calf, background, or feedlot, everything we can do in our sector to improve productivity, improve efficiency. Because in any herd, again, we have five cows, 50 cows, 5,000 cows, regardless of your breed, regardless of your feedlot, background, or cow, calf. Your total output, so pounds of calves weaned, animals sold, per input of herd body weight is going to have a massive influence on resource use, but also, most importantly again, economics. As you know, if all of your cows have a calf every single year, you sell more calf at the end of the year, and you get more cash than you do if 90% of your cows do, or 80, or 70 even. If we improve our output in every system in the beef industry, we're going to make huge strides economically and have the side benefit of, oh yes, less land, less water, less resources. So one example, and it is calving rate, because I personally think that in the average cow-calf operation, calving rate is the biggest opportunity to improve. At the moment in the States, we have an average of 
90% of cows have a calf every single year. So we have 10% of cows just there, you know, eating and grazing and belching and drinking every day, but don't give us a calf. What that does from a carbon point of view is to add 7% to the carbon footprint per pound of beef. If we go to Brazil, South Africa, some parts of Australia, Argentina, Chile, the average calving rate is only 60%. Two-fifths of all of their cows are just there, grazing every single day, giving us no calves. That adds nearly 50% of the carbon footprint per pound of beef. But it comes, as I say, with economic implications as well. Because in terms of feed costs, they go up by 5.5% by us in this country having a 90% calving rate. But in a region with only 60% calving rate, feed costs go up by 58% per pound of beef. That's a huge increase to the industry, but also back down to the consumer. So in terms of total resource use, again, USA, 90% of our cows have a calf every single year. Per pound of beef, that means we need nearly 7% more cattle, 8% more land, and 5% more water per pound. If we go more extensive, again, to Brazil, Chile, Argentina, South Africa, 60% calving rate means we need 44% more total cattle to make a pound of beef, 53% more land, and 34% more water. Huge increases just to make the same amount of beef. So it really can make some huge implications, not by doing anything radically different, not by putting in a digester or changing your feed to some crazy fairy dust stuff because it's supposed to be good and cut carbon. Simply by doing what we do best, managing our cattle well, feeding them well, breeding them well for optimum productivity can allow us to make huge economic and land carbon and water gains every single day. Because ultimately it isn't a race, it's not about the fastest horse past the post. Because what happens in Texas doesn't necessarily work in Oklahoma. What happens in Pennsylvania on a 50 cow operation is not what's going to work in Washington State on a 5,000 cow operation. We've got to tailor all of our individual <laughs> systems to our resources. That means the land, the water, the air, the market, and the people. We can't have the same one-size-fits-all system on a county basis, a state, a, a national, or even a global basis. It doesn't work. But if in all of our individual systems we make the best use of all of our resources and the most efficient use, we really can feed all of those people in the next 40 years in a really effective economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable way. So I'd like to finish up very briefly by talking about social media with a myth. And again, it comes from my friend Michael Pollan, UC Berkeley author of The Omnivore's Dilemma. He was on Oprah, I think it was, a couple of years ago, and he came out with this quote, a vegan in a Hummer has a lighter carbon footprint than a beef eater in a Prius. You know, save the world, don't eat beef, and still drive your Hummer, no problem. The other myth that I keep hearing is that it's farmed livestock that are the problem. You know, it's our beef and our dairy cows belching and farting every single day. They are killing the planet. Whereas a natural ruminant, a bison, for example, no environmental impact because they're natural. They don't emit any carbon from their rumen, even though effectively they're a cow with a really big head, you know, <laughs> they effectively don't have an issue. As a, as a side note, I've also been told um, that bison don't overgraze, which I find quite interesting because if you've got a paddock with in and they can't get out and the grass goes away, they're going to do something. They're not just going to all die, you know. Any animal will overgraze if it's out of grass and it can get out somewhere or whatever. But anyway, bison. I was asked by a colleague to calculate the carbon footprint of a bison because, I, as I say, the perception is that a cow emits carbon but a bison is natural so therefore he or she doesn't. Well, the average bison emits about as much carbon as the average Angus beef cow. Again, this is based on an average cow of 1,200 pounds. 
of which I think there's like seven of them in the whole of the states. But the average cow is about equivalent to a bison. <laughs> but if we put it into context, every free, mo free roaming bison, every bison in Yellowstone Park, for example, emits about as much carbon as driving a car for 4,777 miles. I live in Bozeman, Montana, and I tried to find the place I could drive to in a car that was 4,777 miles, and you just can't do it. But if you drive from Bozeman to the tip of Florida and back up, that's basically about that distance. You know, so it's not just the cattle. It isn't just our farmed animals that have this effect every single day. It's the natural livestock as well. So I've been preaching the values of Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and all of these things for a really long time. Four or five years isn't that long, but it seems like a long time, let's put it that way. But to be honest, I never really believed it. Because I go on Facebook to post pictures of the burger I just ate, or the cookies I made, or my nieces. You know, that's what I use Facebook for. Or that is what I used Facebook for. But I saw this data, and it really gave me some hope. Because 66% of people trust their friends and family to tell them things. Which means that our friends on Facebook, for example, they trust us because we are their friends, or their family, their cousins, their aunts, their uncles, whatever. They trust the government, which <coughs> really surprised me, I have to admit, but that's a reflection of my friends, perhaps, versus the average consumer, I don't know. They trust doctors, and they trust farmers and ranchers. We are highly trusted by the consumer. So the combination of trusting farmers and ranchers and trusting friends and family means that everybody in this room, including the academics as well, I should say, w means we can get messages to the consumer in a trustworthy mechanism to our friends and family, who will then hopefully pass those on to their friends and their family, and on and on and on and on. So as I say, I've been talking about how we do that through Facebook and Twitter for you know years and years, but I never really truly thought it was true. Until a colleague of mine at the University of Montana asked me to calculate how many people we feed on an annual basis from all the cows in our state. So in Montana, we have less than a million people, and we have 1.456 million beef cows. So the beef that eventually comes from those cows provides 12.2 million people with their annual beef every single year. I thought that was pretty cool. You know, we feed with beef basically 12 times more people than are in our entire state. You know, I'm like, that's a touchy-feely good message. So I put that on the top of a picture of the pasture behind my house, cows and calves on it, and I put it on Facebook. And I thought that I would be liked by, you know, four people, and I'd feel really good about myself because four people like this picture, and I'd be all, you know, happy and jolly. One week later, this had been shared by 450 people. That means is they'd taken this picture and p put it on their Facebook page. Now, the average Facebook person has about 200 friends. So potentially, this had been seen by 100,000 people in seven days. And that blew me away. Not in a I'm so great way, but in a wow, we can really reach a lot of people, most of whom have no connection to ag whatsoever, with a pretty picture and a tiny little bit of data. More friends and family and lay people than, than we can ever reach through an advertisement in, you know, Drovers or Hordes Dairyman or a TV show on RFD TV, for example. We can reach random cousins and friends of friends and friends and friends of friends with these kind of messages. And I thought that was a pretty cool thing that we can do. So if you aren't on Facebook or Twitter or any of these things, please be on it or get your kids to show you how to be on it or please have your kids on it, or even your grandkids on it. Get somebody on it showing pictures of your calves, your farm, your hay that you just baled. You know, all of those things, people want to see it, and it does provide some really positive messages for ag and for the beef industry. So I said at the beginning, my, my main aim and my 
personal charge in life is to give you some of the facts and the figures and the numbers and the talking points to counter those things that we hear every single day. You know, beef is killing the planet, we shouldn't eat it, it's full of hormones, etc., etc. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But also, if you think about things in the next hour, day, week, two weeks, and go, you know, I really should have asked that girl something about GMOs, something about hormones in the water supply, something about the whatever, please feel free to email me. So you have my email address right here. I'm on Twitter, for those of you who are, as at Bovidiva, which is a name that somebody else gave me, but it kind of fits. Uh, I have a blog right here, which I update fairly regularly when I have time. And possibly more importantly, there's a copy of this presentation as a PDF at this link right at the bottom. So if you'd like a copy, please go there or email me, ask me afterwards. As I say, I'm always happy to answer emails and questions and whatever, because that's basically what I'm here for. So, and thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you.